Good evening, everyone. Welcome to AVPN South Asia Impact Capital Festival. The theme of this week is healthcare, and this evening we will be discussing improving access to affordable healthcare through critical investments. I'm Komal Sahu, Chief of Sustainable Finance at AVPN, your MC for this session, and I'm delighted to have you join us today. Throughout this month, the festival will spotlight best practices and solutions that AVPN members are delivering across India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. They will address issues ranging from healthcare, livelihoods, climate action, and education, which are of particular urgency for the sub-region today. We're also sharing our highlights of the day live on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. So don't forget to share your experience with us by using the hashtag Impact South Asia 2021. All of you are familiar with Zoom, but a few housekeeping announcements before we move to the main program. If you have any questions for the speakers, we will be holding a 15 minute Q&A at the end. So stay with us. Feel free to type up your questions in the Q&A pod, and we're gonna convey these questions to our speakers. Due to time constraints, the speakers will not be able to respond to all your questions. As the session progresses, drop your comments in the chat box to join in the discussions and continue chatting with your speakers and fellow delegates in this session, please make full use of the messaging function in the platform. You can also continue your conversations with other delegates by posting photos or videos on the feed or engage with other attendees by liking or commenting on their posts. Finally, please note that this session will be recorded and you will be able to access the recording two weeks after the festival. To kick off this session, I would like to invite our moderator, Anuj Sharma, CEO of Alcisa Impact. Anuj, I welcome you and please introduce yourself and the session. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Komal, uh, for the introduction. So, hi, all. Myself, Anuj, uh, I'm founder and CEO of Alcisa Impact. We are South Asia's leading transaction advisors, in impact investing, social enterprise, and scale. In the last two years, 12 years of our inception, we have galvanized directly half a billion dollars of in investing in social enterprise across South Asia. We are sector agnostic in social sector. And with a team of 30 uh, uh, professionals, we work at the intersection of financial advisory, due diligence, legal documentation, ESG investment readiness for social enterprises in this region. And we are passionate about this sector. And, uh, uh, we work across geographies, uh, as I said, and also in lots of rural hinterlands and also in some urban locations. And now let's get started on the deep dive discussion. So we will briefly hear from each speaker before we dive into group discussions on investing in healthcare sector to improve access to affordable healthcare services. And to kick off the session, I would like to uh, welcome our first speaker, Audrey Selim. Uh, Director of Arta Impact to give us a quick introduction to her work. Audrey, please. Thank you so much, Anush, and greetings to everybody. Um, happy to be here uh, as a representative of Arta Impact. Arta Impact is um, the impact investment portfolio of Rianta Capital. Uh, Rianta is an advisory structure to the Singh Family Trusts. And so for the last approximately 15 years or so, We've been active in deploying capital to, to various kinds of transformational uh, so social enterprises in India only. And um, our activity is really focused on the early stage, early growth stage. And uh, we take a patient view uh, to, to the capital that we deploy. And we have the great benefit of working with excellent partners. Anusha has been one of them over the years. Uh, we work very closely with um, a team at Mentera Ventures, the spun out of Vilgro. And in our portfolio currently, um, well, up to date, we've had um, probably half a dozen health specific investments. Um, and so a lot of learning from those and keen to hear from the others about their own. Thank you. Uh, well, we will speak with Audrey again in a bit, but first let's uh, meet our second speaker, uh, Shiva Shankar, uh, Vice President of Alco Capital. Uh, Shiva, please. Thanks, Anuj. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, as Anuj mentioned, I'm the VP uh, at Uncle Capital. Uh, Uncle Capital itself is an early stage VC fund uh, based out of India, focused on technology solutions for the next billion Indians. 
For us, this means looking at opportunities that will empower a broad base of Indian population to improve their lives, uh, typically in three primary sectors, healthcare, medical devices, education, and agri-tech. We do some other sectors as well, but these are the three uh, pillars that we built our uh, model on. Uh, the typical investment for us since, as an early stage VC, we normally come in with about a million dollar check and uh, scale up in our uh, portfolio companies to uh, in follow on rounds up to $5 million. Uh, from our first fund, we've made three investments in the healthcare domain and have another undisclosed uh, investment from our second fund. The three investments from our first fund are uh, ERC Eye Care, an eye care uh, hospital and retail brand based out of the Northeast of India. Uh, Niramai, which is an AI based breast cancer screening tool, and Karma Healthcare, a telemedicine. Uh, company that's primarily uh, looking at healthcare delivery uh, in multiple Indian states from Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, uh, UP, et cetera. Uh, thanks, uh, Shiva. And uh, with this layup, I like, uh, and finally, I would like to uh, introduce our, our last speaker, uh, Marvin Tao, uh, Vice President at Quadria. Marvin, please. Thanks, Anuj. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Mervin. Uh, I work for a firm called Quadra Capital. So we're a healthcare-focused private equity firm based out of Singapore uh, and Delhi. Uh, today, we manage slightly over two billion US dollars of capital across uh, our latest fund, which is our, our fourth investment vehicle. So we only invest in healthcare, uh, but within healthcare, we are brought in terms of we have assets in hospitals, healthcare services, pharma medical technology and, and associated healthcare services. Um, so I think there are a lot of uh, learnings that I'll be keen to share today uh, as you know, we do see an immense opportunity in healthcare in Asia, uh, not just for financial returns, but also on the social impact side. So I, I think we'd love to explore that a little bit more as we uh, go over the course of today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks uh, Marvin. And uh, with that, let's get into the discussion uh, uh, directly. So. Coming back to Audrey, like uh, you'd been one of the key proponents of early investing in healthcare startups, many of whom were too early in the pre-revenue stage. And also there had been uh, some amazing successes as well, uh, uh, such as Biosense Technologies, where you got the exit as well. So how do you gauge your risk and opportunity in that early stage enterprises? And also the importance of patients in the sector, which might be much more than the other sectors. Yes, I have to say um, we've had, um... We've had a, an incredibly enriching journey as um, an active investor in this area. Uh, a lot of learning. Um, our the the Biosense story is is one that's worth highlighting in the sense that it was it was one that was sourced um, and really cultivated very deeply by our partners in Mente at Mentera. We had the privilege of essentially tagging along for the journey, um, and and really. This began with, um, you know, the, the 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 two guys and an idea, and they grew from they grew ten times uh, in revenue in the time that we were engaged in 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 as an investor, and um, running up to 160 million rupees in in turnover, and uh, and really the team grew as well um, incredibly, so this was one example through which we learned. I know how important it is to see product and channel diversity uh, to de-risk this business and overcome what was slow traction in the beginning. And um, it was really, it really was a, a, an investment also very deeply hinged on it, on tech in its way. And I, and I think there was a curve to that process and our ability to be patient and our ability for our partners to be patient together um, really made all the difference. And, and with all of that patience and, and good intention, we, we actually would have been happy to stick along for a much longer part of this ride. But it so happened that the company was so compelling that Perkin Elmer, an S&P 500 company acquired uh, Biosense in, in November of 2019. And uh, we ended up with a, a fairly good result, one that we'd like to sort of hold up as, as evidence that you know, these portfolios and these companies in India specifically are, um, are, are potentially game changers. There's no trade-off when it comes to the dialogue around impact investing in health. Uh, although I do say, uh, I, do, I do think, I, I, I'd love to hear what Shiva and Mervin and, and, and others would think, but it's still a tough space. 
Um, it's still a very tough space. And so we have a couple of other companies. We've taken a, a stronger, I guess, uh, look at antimicrobial resistance as an issue. So that also shows up now prominently in our portfolio. Uh, just would just also love to hear what others are looking at and think are kind of trending. Yeah, thanks, Andre. So, Shiva, like uh, Anku Capital has come up from a seed investor stage to a pre Series A and Series A investments. And you have supported, as, as you rightly said, many amazing uh, healthcare startups as well, uh, including the hotbed of low cost solutions in uh, healthcare that is primarily of global relevance, like ERC Healthcare, which primarily is a is in a geography which is very much like so-called hinterland. So how you identify these opportunities early on and uh, kind of have that support uh, done on a regular basis and on a very longer duration thing, which holds in terms of the patient, but at the same time, having lots of challenge on the ground, like a perspective from your side. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Anush, I think uh, part of the challenge is just coming on board uh, anytime as a first time institute or first institutional investor is never easy because you have to get comfort with the founder, the thought process. So, for us, I think a critical aspect is to just engage with the founders from fairly early on. And uh, this means uh, not quite as frequently now in the COVID context, but we, we travel around to uh, uh, incubators across the country, accelerators, partners that we have. Uh, uh, even in smaller regions and just try to engage with the founders uh, and just make sure we're for ourselves internally highlighting the ones that we thought were interesting teams, interesting models coming through and really give our perspective that uh, at least to go down the VC funding path, what the company needs to do to uh, adjust their model, build up a bit of moat to uh, strengthen themselves to enable it to scale. Um, we've seen a number of interesting solutions come through and uh, for us, uh, it's difficult when you look at uh, medical devices almost to say uh, what it means from a concept stage. Uh, and I think that's the challenge that we're seeing that uh, you can't come in very early because that is, there is a journey to kind of prove medical e efficacy, say that how, how do we actually uh, attest that this is a, a good enough quality product. Uh, one of our investments, Niramai, was uh, an example that was built on the founders actually spending years of research on, on this solution before a, a company was really uh, set up for this purpose. Uh, explicitly, but uh, we could see by the data that had been gathered that um, a, a, even though there wasn't a double blind clinical trial that had gone in, uh, it, there was enough of an infrastructure of uh, a deep rigorous thought process of how the product had really uh, been evolved to a level that we felt uh, it's now an attractive proposition for us to come in as a fund and uh, try to help the company grow and to really prove its efficacy, which uh, they have through multiple trials since we've been invested. Uh, to the question you asked about Hinterland, I, I think uh, it, it's a challenge based on region, but uh, it, it really depends on what you're looking to set up there. So uh, we've invested in geographies like Jorhat, which is where VRC was initially based, uh, and uh, Neemach as well, which is another uh, part of Madhya Pradesh, which I don't know how many other investors have really looked at as investment opportunities. Uh, but for us, what we looked at there is, uh, is the team and the model, is it uh, possible to build up a team and, and this type of business model in these geographies? So an investor like ERC is actually based, you're not trying to attract a, a bunch of uh, technology talent to say you will be based in Jorhat. There's kind of a very clear headquarter operations that are being set up in uh, more developed cities. But what you're saying is, can I get access to high enough quality medical talent in these regions, which was true. Uh, and if you look at what it meant uh, for the company itself, they're in a market where 45 million people reside, no established eye care brand exists, either on the hospital side or on uh, as a retail chain even. And the prevalence of avoidable blind, blindness is over the national average of 80%. So there's a market. What you have to prove is, is there a product market fit by which you can deliver at a price point uh, that will enable the company to scale? So we know generally what uh, private equity investors were looking at of saying, this is when we can come in as follow-on capital and push the company to really deliver to those metrics. Say, now they're not just going to be operating a certain number of hospitals. There is a capacity now for this model to evolve from Assam to the Northeast to regions that uh, are beyond that as well. So uh, I think it was a question of identifying uh, that the need is very clearly there. And I think uh, from a healthcare side, there is a need for a large need in this space. It's about saying, what would you need to demonstrate to investors to say, you also have a product market fit, not just a large market. And now it makes sense to go down this path. Thanks, uh, Shiva. So over to you, uh, Marvin. And Quadri has been a big supporter of healthcare like uh, in, in multiple countries in Asia. 
and how you are able to identify the right fit a healthcare startup that has both zeal of making an impact and also a sustainable long run with your lens sure no th thanks for that question I, th I think you know a lot of majority of what we do at quadria is in the growth equity space to be honest so you know these are businesses that we invest in are typically post profit scalable large businesses where you know we really put significant capital to support growth and and that typically in, in the traditional hospital or pharmaceutical space uh, however we do recognize that as an opportunity in healthcare startups uh, even before covid in particular in health tech uh, and I think what COVID has done is that it actually accelerated the adoption of health technology in a speed that no one could have imagined. If you ask, you know, investors a year ago to do something in health tech, you know, maybe it's less interesting. But today, I think that there's a lot more investor interest and momentum in that space. Uh, and I think, you know, also as a result of COVID, um, healthcare operators and business owners and private equity investors like us. Uh, also thinking more about how can we leverage technology to help solve the real challenges that Asian healthcare faces, right? And in the quadra, we really focus on, on four key areas. One is accessibility, mm -hmm. uh, affordability of healthcare, uh, awareness, and most importantly, quality of, of the healthcare uh, we're delivering as well. So I think overall, we, we see a lot of potential across uh, healthcare startups, in particular on the, the digital health side. Um, and they seem to have very good traction at the top line growth, uh, obviously with the tailwinds of, of COVID this year. I think fundamentally for us as investors, the question remains uh, on how can we build a commercial model, right? And turn these companies profitable and sustainable because a lot of the, the, the healthcare tech companies while able to show uh, very exponential revenue growth have not been able to, to show equally strong bottom line growth. I think that's the struggle that, that the investors like us uh, see. And again, uh, having recognized that it is an important space and there could be benefits of, of that there's a very strong role for, for health technology and startups. We have actually started a sister fund a couple of years ago, Cal Health Court, that actually looks at the more early stage uh, companies to see how we can work with these companies to actually make our hospitals more efficient, more affordable and more accessible for the local populations that, that we invest in. That's great. So back to Audrey. So Audrey, like, uh, what are the broad parameters you see in healthcare uh, startups uh, since you already spoken about the patients and importance of it and other things? So if I want to like go back and understand like I invest in lens from your side, what are the broad parameters you see with regards to the role of technology or the affordability of it? And also, how you identify early stage commercial model uh, in healthcare sector, which is slightly different than the other social startups that you work with as well. Thank you, Anuj. Um, I think, uh, I mean, we've we've looked at very different types of technologies that are being adopted and applied through very different companies. So I'm not sure I'm necessarily able to draw uh, perfect parallels or a great uh, consolidated view. Uh, I mean, overall, the, um, whether it's um, a focus on the use of technology for rapid scale, like diagnostics, uh, for the uh, increasing the ease of access to underserved communities, whether it's using technology platforms to deliver effective you know, health training support for those who are health workers. We have a company called Virohan that's that, that's focused on uh, on on education in in this area. Uh, whether it's looking at simply, um, yeah, delivering a, a core product for, for for women's health that's that's dependent on uh, some sort of a an automated production process. Um, for sanitary napkins, we have such a wide variety. Uh, what we're ultimately looking for is, are these folks able to strike up the partnerships with whether it's leading hospitals or corporates or governments or clinics or clinicians to be able to deliver at scale? It's really less a question about, I mean, you can have the perfect technology. It may be flawless, um, which, you know, if anyone has ever found that, please let me know. It may be flawless, but uh, it's a function of having a certain diversity 
in the product offering um, and the partnerships to be able to deliver on this. So broad parameters, I think, we're often looking for that uh, evidence of that ability, evidence of that ability to think laterally across all the other health interventions, because we're ultimately looking at acupuncture points that hopefully are, for, are in aggregate supporting a health system strengthening, like writ large. And so how do you know when you're looking at one small intervention that you know in the, in the wider scale, um, it's going to be propagated and um, unleashing secondary and tertiary other uh, effects as a result? Um, so this is a broad answer for a broad question. Um, I hope that that sheds you know, some light yeah. or at least sparks some of the conversation for Shiva and Mervyn. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, thanks for Audrey. So Shiva, like a uh, larger thing from your side, how you like, uh, what are the broad metrics uh, Anko Capital uses to capture and measure, uh, measure the access to quality healthcare? And also, what is the importance of commercial model versus the impact and how you balance both? Because you are both very early stage and getting into the series A uh, spectrum. Yeah, yeah. So from uh, just the assessment framework that we have, Anuj, for, uh, uh, for our companies, I think it will be helpful if I just say, uh, set the broad context and then dive into the two separate models, because I think uh, healthcare delivery and IP innovations are slightly different. So all of our investments go through a process uh, where we're presenting a, a logic model of saying, how are we envisioning the impact for the company to go at the time of investment for the next five, seven years? And really every few years uh, from that check-in, I'm saying, uh, are we on this right path of what, how we're envisioning the impact of the organization to spread? Uh, so if I think specifically for the healthcare delivery models, it's easier because you can look at the companies as the time we're coming in of having had a thesis of saying, this is these are the target geographies we will be in, these are the ta uh, target population of the types of services we're providing, which uh, are very different from what's commercially available. And inherently, as the company scales, if it does, you will be creating that impact to a, a much larger uh, geographic net. So we do call out for each of the companies that this is the really t uh, target geography that they're starting off with, and this is how we're envisioning it grow. It, it may not literally be on the same linear path that we're drawing out at that point, but it, it gives us an indicative idea of how they're going. Uh, in IP-led models, which is a new innovation, new process, it's much, uh, it's much tougher. And uh, I think I, I can talk you through some of the variables of what we talk about. So uh, one is how does it fit in the current system? Because healthcare isn't something that you can provide as any delivery of care isolated. It has to kind of fit in the spectrum of how the patient will get the rest of their care. Uh, we obviously dig and try to work as much as we can to make sure there's some pro proven, proven medical effic efficacy as we're coming in. So at least have something in a small independent setting to say, is it worth really scaling this up and doing this in an independent trial setting? Uh, the price point of saying, is it radically cheaper? Uh, but it's not just the price point, but I think it's also about saying, can you actually apply this now in a different setting? So the physical or technical requirements of the product make it applicable for a much larger set of the population. Uh, independent of, I think, what medical device you look at, uh, the highest end ones are 80% of them are probably sitting in our uh, top five or six cities. So it, it's it, there's considerable room to say if you have a product that can actually be applied to a much larger set of the population, um, there is a market for you to be able to roll that out. And if that is the case, we try to assess the market. Of course, this is again from a commercial side of, is it applicable only in India, Asia, globally? How big can this uh, opportunity really be? So for us, we try to balance out and find models that actually have this ingrained that for them to be successful, uh, it's not that they can really do it at a micro scale. They have to scale the impact as well inherently in it. So uh, we try to uh, look for models where that feels a bit more entwined inherently in the model. Anuj, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, uh, hi, Marvin. Uh, coming back to you. Like, uh, so uh, being an investor who primarily invests uh, big ticket investments in the sector, how do you gauge the healthcare impact investing valuations where the startups are perfect in the market and their product fit? And many of these startups also need substantial money in the early part of their life cycles where valuation discovery is still like is an ongoing process. It's not been frozen. So how you kind of take a more holistic view and take it forward? So I, I see you left the uh, the hardest valuation question uh, to, to the end. Uh, but look, this is, a, this is a tricky one. I mean, look, valuations in Asia, 
yeah. are rich. And when you talk about healthcare valuations, I think the technical term is crazy when it comes to healthcare valuations in Asia. And I think to a large extent that has spilled over to health startups as well. Uh, and in my mind, I think you know the key, the two key questions really around health startup valuation is I think one which Shiva mentioned earlier is scale. Uh, we have seen that uh, larger players with a larger customer base or membership base actually generate a significant premium compared to its peers. And I think the second, the second key important factor in my mind would be the monetization pathway. Um, you know. I think some of the rich valuations are being driven off, uh, you know, annual revenue run rates. Uh, but at some point, I think investors will require you to generate some real operating cash flows, right? Otherwise, you know, those valuations, I don't think will be sustainable over the long time. And I think the ability to crack that monetization model uh, is, is a very critical one that I don't think many companies have really succeeded uh, in the health tech space. Uh, to your point around raising capital, um, I think what I would, my, my only recommendation is, you know, raising capital is just one way of funding your startup. There could be other models. So in some of our hospitals, for example, uh, we have actually worked with some of our startups to co-develop their technology. We are putting in capital, uh, sometimes as equity partners, but sometimes because we see the value in what they're doing and how it can actually help our business in the end. So thinking, thinking out of the box, it's not just about, you know, raising money for third party investors, but is there an opportunity to partner with a large customer for your product that will help them solve a critical issue they're facing or, you know, help them perform better. Uh, and I think there's a significant role around that because, you know, with COVID, a lot of the, the big healthcare services assets, uh, pharma companies, I mean, they are stretched as well and they are facing a lot of crunch within the organization. So if there's a way to make them more efficient and uh, able to deliver care to more people uh, at a lower cost, I think, you know, that could be another angle to, to, to explore. Great. Thanks, Mervin. So I, I would like to just also pose one question to uh, Audrey. We are being a, uh, a female investor, uh, very rare. Second is like she is also focused on women-focused healthcare initiatives as well. So you are on board of a uh, amazing company which is focusing on menstrual uh, like uh, pads, and uh, not an easy segment to be in. And lots of other companies are. So how you balance your like obviously your expertise as a female investor, but at the same time focusing on a female gender lens investing in this space for healthcare. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that mention, Anuj. Um, I think, well, I mean, it, those two things are, are not mutually exclusive in any way, uh, in, 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 in a sense. And uh, this is an example of a, of a company that's it's operating in a, in a tough space where it comes back down just to the fundamentals um, and the, the strategy for monetization as, as Mervyn was, was referring to. And particularly in a, in a, in a space where you know, small companies just don't have the wherewithal to be able to generate massive you know, e-commerce success from their own site. And they're just not gonna be able to serve. I mean, they do all the social side of this, which is the distribution of you know, appropriately priced or free in some cases, sanitary napkins in this case to very underserved communities. You're totally fulfilling a social mission. It's, it's part of why we got involved. In this case, um, we've been very happy to, seven years on, we've been very happy to see an incredible evolution in the quality of the product where the company, this company happens to excel in the quality of the product. It's, it's, it's awesome absolutely comparable to what you see on shelves and pharmacies well, here where I live. Um, the issue though remains, you know, we, we're, we're a patient investor, we're here for that mission. Um, what's going to be the tipping point? Uh, and, you know, the exploration of B2B and B2C in this instance has been a very rich one and we're learning a ton. And part of this is, is really about that B2B story. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, overall, uh, we're, yeah, it's, it's, it's because of our patience that I think we've been able to arrive to this point. And that gender lens piece um, is really part and parcel of part and parcel, excuse me, of our approach across the board. Um, we won't want to leave or leave this company in a lurch um, unless they've found a way to stabilize and ensure that what they're doing will be sustained. 
Thanks, uh, Audrey. So, uh, Shiva, I go back to one of the important things that you mentioned is IP production and other things. So, at a larger level, like healthcare companies are more vulnerable towards IP theft and also the way they can monetize the IPs. So, what your take is, like, because IP is a long drawn process, and especially in countries like India, where filing of IP by itself means like you need to find some knowledgeable lawyers. And sometimes it's a luxury which you may not be able to afford. And even if you have, the infringements are pretty common as well. So as an investor, how you look into this whole thing and how you support it? Yeah. So uh, I completely agree with what you're saying, Anuj. I think in the domestic context, it's a challenge to say if there's a kind of smaller product variation uh, and you're trying to protect that, that it uh, gets differentiated. For, for us, primarily what we have been looking at have been models which are uh, in their own sense, uh, in incorporating algorithms and AI deeper into the model. So it's not that the IP that they are building out is a very clear medical patent of saying, or a patent that's relating to a physical product of saying, this is what we are protecting. Because uh, like you said, there can be clones in the market that domestically will stop you from uh, really be able to get to scale. Um, and so for us, the uh, and just from the thesis of how what we feel can really fit from an early stage VC funding aspect, because a lot of the physical medical products have to go through a much longer trial cycle. So for us, the concept of uh, a number of other uh, analysis tools that are coming through, for example, on uh, AI tools that are on uh, is an oncology layer of saying uh, you have a number of different reports. Can we actually start to streamline that? Because it's not easy for a specialization, a specialist in only one tier to be able to get a broader view of what your condition could be and what other implications are. So we're trying to find ways that you can actually uh, incorporate these systems, which are um, uh, not really patentable, but it's core IP the same way that you have as any other software technology company. Uh, and what you're proving is actually uh, the medical efficacy. Uh, so that part of the healthcare journey, you're still going on and saying, we've gone through in independent trials and said, this is actually was able to stand up and uh, create value. I think from a hardware product perspective, uh, it, it's tougher in that segment. And that's why we've generally avoided uh, going too deep in those models. Great. And Barbun, uh, a larger question, like again, like a tough question, obviously, being, being the larger investor in space. Uh, how do you foresee the healthcare sector in South Asia, which is primarily home to one fifth of the world's population? Now, we have shaping up in post-COVID-19 scenario where there's a renewed vigor towards healthy living, sustainable futures, and lots of conversation going on. So do you see uh, like uh, the whole shift towards uh, this whole uh, sector uh, go, getting into positive uh, impetus, or it is a short-lived phenomenon? Yeah, look, I think if you if you look at South Asia and Southeast Asia, where, where I spend a, a lot of my time as well, if you combine those two regions, right? I mean, we account for, for something like two-fifths of the world population, right? About 30% of the world population. You know, we have 50% of the global chronic disease burden, yet we're spending less than 10% of global healthcare spend, right? So the math just doesn't work out, right? That there is a big demand supply gap, you know, by all measures of doctors per thousand, hospitals per thousand, uh, the fact that healthcare spend is 70% out of pocket. So even before COVID, I think there, we, we all recognize that there is a, a big opportunity, but more importantly, how do we access uh, this healthcare opportunity. And I think uh, from, from our perspective, what COVID has done is that it actually brought healthcare to the central of private and public agenda when everyone recognizes because of COVID, uh, the problem actually gets surfaced to a very real level when you have relatives who are not being able to go to ICU. It, it actually comes up to the surface. And I think this will only serve to drive more investments uh, into the sector. And I think whether it's South Asia or Southeast Asia, um, a lot of the governments re recognize that they can't fund healthcare, right? And, and, they, and that's where private capital facilitators like ourselves uh, have to take the lead. Um, in fact, I think in, in India, if I'm not wrong, seven out of 10 new hospitals are built by the private sector, right? So we see an immense opportunity for private sector players like us to, to play into. Uh, in terms of near-term trends, I think that there could be um, areas such as mental health, uh, digital health is, is taking up shape, but you know, it's still left to be seen if this is only during COVID or will people still revert back to wanting to see their doctor physically, right? But you know, the, there is good uptake. Um, but I think COVID doesn't really fundamentally change the opportunity that we have here in Asia. Uh, if anything, it actually accelerates that. 
Right. So now I just want to pose a question to all of you as a panelist. Like, so one side we say primary care health uh, focus, there is a tertiary care and also the intervention of technology. We keep talking about technology and the investments are kind of squeezed towards the technology as well. At the same time, healthcare is a broader subject. And till the time we are not having a on ground physical interventions, it's not going to solve the problems. So as investors, how you how you see like because technology is easy to kind of get the valuation attractive uh, propositions to the larger problem we are talking with the same time, uh, it doesn't solve a fundamental thing, which is primarily directed towards a physical intervention as well. So as investors, how, how you look into it, like and I'm posing an open house here. Anybody? Uh, so Mervin, you want to go first? Oh, I, I no, no, you. please, 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 please. No, no, I, I was, uh, no, go for it, Shiva. So, uh, Anuj, I completely uh, understand the problem that you are posing. And, and I think that's a very valid concern. That, that, that This is the part of the model. I think that the evolution will start from saying there's these new technology models. Of course, they make sense in, uh, in specific subcontexts, and those can kind of scale uh, in a more natural, organic path. Uh, I, I think fundamentally, if we look from a primary healthcare delivery, uh, there are the challenges that Mervin actually just flagged of saying there is a drastic shortage here of who can actually provide the care. Uh, and I think if you look at uh, just the filters of levels of saying generically, of course, it's there on uh, uh, on just doctors uh, as an overall population. But even if you look down to saying, if you try to get a scan, are there enough radiologists in the country? So if you try to get a technology solution that doesn't have the same requirement of a radiologist uh, physically there in person, or is able to get that radiologist to considerably improve capacity. That does link to uh, an increase in physical availability of uh, these. I, I, the challenge of it still being geographically linked, I think is there. Uh, and I don't think that's an easy resolution to go through. I think that's where there needs to be some link to uh, government programs as well as saying, at some point saying there's a geographical spread and this gets provided as access points in other regions probably does need a bit more intervention than private sector can provide as a first step, right? Uh, even as impact investors, I think we start off with something that's closer aligned to the existing business model, uh, trying to set up, for example, a full uh, rural hospital in a region that doesn't uh, have as much uh, proven demand is going to be a challenge for any organization to start off with. So I think that is going to be a problem we probably progressively address rather than immediately. I'll just add one thought. Oh, sorry, Mervin, did you want no, to say no, something? Please, please, Audrey, go for it. I'll just add one thought. You know, the um, the companies that we're investing in and that we're supporting, they may be really concentrated on a particular, again, a particular type of technological application. But then for this to work, they invest an inordinate amount of time and energy in, under, in forging relationships with hospitals or clinics or with appropriate you know, it could be public sector bodies to be able to get their model to work. Um, in some rare instances, there may be direct 100% overlap uh, of the utility of a particular tool, but actually we, we don't run into that that much. So if, if, you know, three funds like ours just looked into our own portfolios and maybe, I don't know, picked a dozen, two dozen possible opportunities where one or another existing relationship or distribution channel, or um, yeah, maybe just maybe just linkages, just to start, um, can afford a more fluid technology transfer, a more fluid approach to propagating an amazing solution. Um, there are so many ways that we can look at, you know, the the future of scale, and it. And thinking out of the box in this regard, um, primarily because you know we can we can call ourselves impact investors. Maybe that also means we we can behave a little bit differently than than how you know venture capitalists normally would. There may be opportunities um, that that we may be um, able to explore in the future. So just flagging that random thought. Well, th thanks, Audrey. I was going to echo that actually. I mean, look. You know, we we can continue to build hospital beds in this part of the world for the next ten years, and it still won't be enough, right? So we'll continue to do that. Uh, you know, and, and I think the biggest and I think the biggest thing about technology is that it helps accelerate that that provision of accessible health. And I'll give you two examples. So one, uh, in India, we have uh, a basically an EICU facility, 
when we actually have remote monitoring of ICU patients 200 kilometers away from our central uh, headquarters. And we actually have a critical, care, a very good critical care physician uh, in that center actually monitoring patients from 200 kilometers away. And we have a nurse and house doctor who will handle situations there. So you go from patients who traditionally have not been able to get any ICU care to immediately 200 patients who can get access to that care. So that's one direct way of how technology actually uh, was able to create more access. And because you know you don't have to you house a few critical health physician doctors there, the cost of healthcare to those patients in, in that area is also much lower. Uh, the other thing that we did in India also is, is on the home healthcare side, uh, using technology to actually uh, track and monitor our patients and providing uh, not basic home health care, but complex home health care, things like ICU at home, dialysis and chemotherapy at home. So these are, again, different business models, not so much technology, uh, where you're not really building hospitals and infrastructure that's CapEx heavy, but yet you can create the same uh, care outcomes that, that you would have uh, without spending that kind of money. So I, I think technology is a key enabler, but, you know, we will still need to, to, to carry on with the, the work of, of creating infrastructure, which, you know, is significantly under-indexed in this part of the world. Great. So I think it is a good time to also delve deep into the audiences, like if there's any question. Yeah, so one of the audience question is, how can impact investors better contribute to best practices and more transparency in impact measurement in order to facilitate a more robust Indian investment markets? Yeah, Shiva, Audrey, Robin. So uh, from our side, uh, Anuj, what we try to do is uh, we're fairly active when it comes to a number of these industry associations like Jin and just uh, really uh, pass on the information uh, of this is how uh, impact has progressed. This is how we're viewing impact. Like I said, uh, our view of actually going about it is not to do uh, a year on your account of the same metric of saying um, uh, how many people has, uh, for example, an IP-led model, how many people have been tested uh, with the solution. I think for us, it is saying, uh, year one to three, uh, it's a question of can you get a proof point that does the product work uh, in a large enough setting? Are these uh, medical efficacy uh, at a strong enough point? And then can you build the channel partners late, uh, later and say, can this really be rolled out to actually affect and be able to be used as a free screening tool, either for a larger uh, portion of the population or uh, geography, whichever way it gets identified. So I think for us, we're just making sure that the metrics we're assessing get transparently actually passed on to these industry associations. And then uh, there are kind of uh, impact reports that are coming through uh, that are aggregating this across a number of other uh, providers of saying, uh, this is how the impact lens can be viewed for the direct delivery models and also the technology models. And uh, I think we will see a narrowing down of the metrics that we are all using to being a, a smaller set. But I think it, it needs to start probably broad of saying, this is what feels the right thing to track. And then uh, over years, it will narrow to uh, the right metrics, the right models. Right. Uh, anybody else want to add in? So I might just another... add... yes, Sorry, Anush. I might just add one, one quick thought. Hmm. I mean, the um, impact investors who are looking across sectors uh, could probably uh, do collectively a, a better job in terms of that exactly that flow of information that Shiva is referring to. Um, looking across sector, uh, specifically at other things like SDG six, uh, water and sanitation, it's the biggest driver for improved health outcomes across the world, without question. Uh, and it's one of the things where, you know, there's so many opportunities for more uh, tactical. Um, I guess, um, yeah, just uh, co collaboration, thinking about, you know, well, if you know five or six really active, you know, SDG six water and sanitation investors working in a district where you're investing in a healthcare play, might be a good idea to tie up and figure out what's going on there and see if there's synergies to be explored. I mean, these are positive self-reinforcing feedback loops. And as we get better with also getting, you know, I think there's quite a, some of us have a ways to go. Uh, and I think across the board, uh, the industry is probably getting better, but as we get better understanding the feedback loops, like directly from the citizens, is something working? Are we reducing the scope of a negative externality as a collective? As we get better at answering those questions, I think we'll probably get better as well at you know promoting some of the best practices and you know highlighting the, the metrics that really matter. Um, so just, just a thought there.
Anuj, you're mute. Anuj, you're muted. Ah, sorry. So question for Mervyn, uh, how much impact investors like Cordria focus their investments on prevention and healthcare, especially given that Asia have, uh, shoulders most of the world's disease burden in upcoming years? That's the way people are thinking. Yeah. You know, we, we're big proponents of, of preventive healthcare, uh, but you know, the, 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 the ground realities and I think in South Asia and, and emerging Southeast Asia is the fact that you know, most of the population pay for healthcare out of pocket mm -hmm. and, you know, they can't afford to go for, you know, health screening. I mean, this is the last thing on their mind, right? Every year is to go for a health screening or go for a check, right? And it's usually until a catastrophic event happens and then like a heart attack and then they go to the hospital and realize, you know what, I'm now stuck with a big medical bill that I have to pay. So that's just, I think, the, the reality of the market for most of the populations in these markets. So what we try and do is, is to figure out, okay, look, what are the kind of preventive healthcare models or, or diagnostics models that we can work on? And how do we actually scale it up such that it's affordable so that people actually see the value of, of what they're paying for and they can actually afford it? So in India, for example, we own a business called Strand Life Sciences, which is a specialized uh, cancer testing center. You know, and we offer cancer testing at like 10% of what you will pay in the US, right? So at those kind of levels, um, patients or, you know, people actually feel that, hey, hang on, you know, there's value in me going for this test rather than, you know, getting a disease, you know, too late in the game where, you know, I'm stuck with a, a bill that, 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 you know, I can't afford, right? So that, that's one example. And in Malaysia as well, we own yeah. uh, the largest in-hospital lab group called LabLink. Uh, and over there, it's the same thing. We're, you know, we're trying to advance um, diagnostics and, and, and pathology testing so that we actually catch diseases earlier on before it develops to something more sinister. So I, I think, you know, we're big proponents of that, but I think it's being able to scale that and bring it to a cost low enough for, you know, the mass population to actually uh, take it up. Great. Uh, there's a question for Shiva here. So one of your investments, Karma Healthcare, uses a tech-enabled model to bridge healthcare gaps in rural India. So given the recent prolification of telehealth due to COVID, how can you, how can we expand this digital outreach, especially to more underserved areas that have low access to technology? Yeah, so uh, it, it's been an interesting journey, Anuj, I think since we went in uh, probably about 12 months ago at this point, and uh, just the regulation changes around e-pharmacies, delivery of health through telemedicine models. Uh, domestically, you've seen a, a lot of those barriers that were limiting growth or limiting uh, uh, both customer and, and I'd say kind of uh, stakeholder interest in, in engaging with these models really being removed. So um, the uh, Karma themselves has actually looked at this as a way to uh, engage with a number of partners in new geographies in uh, for services that they weren't offering of saying, uh, can we actually now try to engage with uh, a pharmacy model to layer that into the business model as well of saying there's a more complete holistic version of what needs to be delivered as care. And uh, the platform needs to be open enough to uh, take this to new regions and also make sure there's a more complete suite of uh, services being offered. So I, I think you're seeing that with uh, the way the models, uh, not just there, but uh, others have evolved as well, of saying there needs to be a broadening of uh, these models. And now with part of the regulatory barriers being removed, I think you're seeing a number of people start to experiment with how this will work together to become an efficient delivery mechanism of uh, healthcare services. Right. Um, there is a question for Audrey here. So how do you measure the qualitative impact of your investments or initiatives? Um, thank you. So uh, I think we, um, we have kind of a, a couple of categories of what we consider qualitative criteria, mm -hmm. uh, which allows us to assess generally kind of the social dynamics of the enterprise itself. Um, uh, and the, the out, outcomes that it seeks to uh, achieve in terms of the, the subjective experience of the beneficiary um, and the, the, the subjective, uh, the opinion of the beneficiary. And we are also looking at things like enterprise dynamics. Are we generally seeing, you know, a multiple stakeholder, multi-stakeholder approach to running the business? Are we generally seeing a movement towards improvements in supply chains, better, more fairness in the way that, you know, um, maybe it's maybe it's a community owned model. Maybe they're looking at ESOP models. We're just generally looking for various signals or flags 
that um, the enterprise dynamics just generally qualitatively are heading in the right direction. We're also looking at generally like scalability and environmental um, considerations yeah. around, uh, you know, is what's the feedback? What are the feedbacks lo loops telling us? They may not be um, terribly rigorous and that they're, they're, they may not be, you know, surveying thousands of the beneficiaries, but we're trying to glean what we can to understand whether or not this is being perceived as an appropriate product or service and whether there's urgency that's being actually addressed. So um, I'd say the qualitative assessment is a hodgepodge of all of the above. And um, there was a point about, um, uh, earlier point about preventive healthcare in the Indian landscape. And, um, and just from the perspective, this may be a very um, a Western perspective here. Um, there's so much wrong with the food systems that, um, that channel the, the Western American standard diet that's leading to so much rampant, every kind of disease, everything from every, le every level of autoimmune disorder to cancer, to every type of cancer. And the richness of what's in the Indian landscape the knowledge, um, you know, Ayurveda, just as just to start. I mean, there's there's so much intrinsic knowledge that I feel the impact investors are one tiny one tiny lever in the broader kind of healthcare system, which can be used to test stuff, take some risk, you know, do some stuff that maybe you know it's too small or too early for for the larger players to play with. I know I'm speaking very generally, but I feel like there's a little bit of a blind spot when it comes to the sort of more in indigenous knowledge around what serves as preventive health uh, care. And I feel like that's something that um, it would be interesting to see the players emerging that, that are able to put that front and center in their strategies. Very well said, Audrey. So there's a, another question, which is uh, for anybody here. Uh, so how do you foresee any potential you have for the use of programs as a social impact or health impact bonds or grant funds? So one side is debt, one side is equity, but at the same time in healthcare, you see a potential of uh, these impact bonds as well. Shiva, Marvin, Audrey, anybody want to take it up? Yeah, I, I, I can start. Well, we, we are kind of, I mean, Quadra, we're kind of a beneficiary of, of the social impact bond. So we have a slightly different uh, product with ING. So uh, what ING did for us was a um, uh, ESG tech subscription financing. So basically the better we do at our portfolio company level, we get better financing rates on, on our subscription lines. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a good move uh, to create uh, and encourage more investors to to think more deeply on, on impact. But I think it's a fairly nascent uh, product uh, in, in the market. Um, well, my hope is that it continues to grow, but just given you know the need for significant capital in this space, I think it's, it's a good space to be in, but I think a large bulk of, of investments will still come uh, through the traditional uh, instruments of, of equity or, or debt. Right. And then there is another question that says that there is much focus on healthcare solutions that can be met by impact investing. But how do we ensure the focus is on patient and that we are added, adding value towards the overall healthcare system and addressing the root of the problems? So yeah, good question. Yeah. yeah yeah no i'm happy to just have a quick, a quick comment here i think look at the end of the day it has to be focused on on the patient i think i think uh the benefit that we have in, in in this part of the world unlike in the west where a lot of the healthcare infrastructure is legacy infrastructure uh so there are not many new hospitals in the uk for example a lot of this has been built a long time ago we, we actually have the opportunity here to build healthcare uh in a model that fits what people need, which is affordable and, and, and high quality and, and low cost, right? So, so we had the opportunity to do this. So I think building, finding the right business model that can, uh, that can match both price and accessibility uh, would be key. And then we have the opportunity to do that given that, you know, we are in the face of actually building out that, that infrastructure. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, some of the ways that we're thinking about is home healthcare, single specialty models where we've put a thousand bit gastric sciences hospital, for example, in Hyderabad. 
um, things like diagnostics, pathology, you know, what is the model of care, you know, that can really bring the cost down such that you can give more people healthcare, uh, focusing on the patients, uh, in bringing the price down, but also making sure that the quality of your care um, is as good as, you know, what they can get anywhere else in the world. So I, I think I totally agree. End of the day, it has to be a no point creating a, a, a very expensive hospital that, you know, no one can afford. So I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, and just to build on what Mervyn said, I, I think when it comes to the uh, delivery of care, we are so uh, we are so abysmal at just how much, how little access there is across uh, the region that um, I think there's less of a challenge there. I think there is a principal issue of saying when we're looking at these new tech models, how do you make sure it's relevant for patient care at that point? And I think uh, that's why making sure you have, you're still going through the process of saying, how are we actually validating this by or doing some sort of independent trials of getting it published in trade journals that are of repute. So still looking at the landsets, et cetera, saying this is an institution that has gone and assessed technologies over the years and saying, if you've proven yourself here, uh, this is a level that you can say this evolution of a technology is now relevant for a much larger setting. So I, I think it's important to still uh, take the technology models and say, what is a relevant version of how we can assess this in a, in a pragmatic setting, which is independent of the company's own objectives, which you will always have a, a slight bias there. So I think the uh, medical efficacy just be becomes that hurdle. Great. Just on this um, patient centrism issue, just this point, I mean, anyone who's been diagnosed with one or another something uh, will attest to the fact that you enter immediately a massive labyrinth of information and knowledge uh, that you don't necessarily know how to decipher. And um, I mean, of, of course, you know, the formal institutional um, you know, medical knowledge is, is, is of course to be revered, but there's also a lot of kind of citizen level experience that, um, that when aggregated and accumulated actually provides access to potential alternatives um, that, um, that are not necessarily covered overtly by allopathic approaches. And I think that the opportunity in terms of the patient centrism is also on the community and network building side where people are able to share experiences. And I'm not talking, you know, I don't feel good on Tuesday. I'm talking, you know, I, I tried something um, that, um, that might have been experimental or I've tried a dietary change or I've tried something else, which you may not have covered in a, in a, in a hospital setting or in a clinic setting. And I think that that's also the opportunity. And it's also something to be looking out for from an investment perspective in terms of those support networks that are emerging for citizen-centered science. Great. So uh, just to kind of uh, rushing into the conclusion, thanks a lot for such a great uh, conversation here. So a few of the things which emerged very amazingly was like the importance of IP we had, uh, the importance of collaborations between like-minded investors and also the healthcare uh, companies, uh, importance of patients in this sector, and uh, monetization pathways, but very important, which Audrey also pointed out, like indigenization or let's say the natural, natural sciences, which needs to come into picture as well, more beyond the uh, set allopathic or the so-called uh, Western side, uh, but having Asian side as well, in terms of how you can focus on the healthcare. So wanted to have a quick uh, closing remarks from all the speakers here. We can start with Audrey, yeah. Um, I mean, just yeah. just sort of uh, rounding it out. It's it's um, it's of great interest uh, to to us to to learn from our peers. Um, we are ex extremely keen on uh, helping to elevate the visibility, uh, not only of our own portfolio uh, companies, of course, but but of those that we find that um, that our peers are working on when they know that you know they may need another type of um, financing to support uh, a blended approach to. Um, to, to, to helping you know, the, the intervention in question be successful. So we have um, a spin out of our Artha platform called Baraka Impact focused just on health in low and middle income countries. And it's a system that is there to allow for the profiling of everybody's portfolios to the extent that they may be ready for secondaries. So um, just wanted to flag that as my sort of closing comments and to say, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you. It's been a great learning for me. Thank Thanks, Audrey. Sure. Uh, so uh, I don't just to reiterate, I, I think for us, we're 
so we'll see a, a number of opportunities as you flagged off the, at the start. Uh, we are in kind of one of the, uh, the labs of health innovation, if I can uh, put it that way, in India. And uh, we're excited to see what other uh, innovations now come through to try to create a new, uh, a new delivery mechanism, be it through uh, some sort of AI-led IP or whatever uh, the process ends up being. So we're quite excited to look for what else will come through because we're, uh, we're seeing the early pipes of that building out. And uh, yeah, just excited to see these things now roll out from a India to have applications across uh, Asia and globally as well. Uh, been a really enjoyable conversation. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I guess others muted, yes, but, but yeah. that's me. Uh, well, look, as jaded as I am from a year of COVID and, and travel lockdowns, I think my, my message would be there is a significant opportunity for, for financial returns and social outcomes in Asian healthcare. Um, and, you know, it's down to really private equity or not private healthcare and private capital facilitators like ourselves to really lead the way. Uh, in many of these countries in Asia. So I would be very keen to, to continue this dialogue uh, with my fellow colleagues on this call or whoever else is, is listening in, in today. Um, mm -hmm. And I strongly believe that we have a, a, a critical role to play here. Great, so with this, uh, thanks a lot. I would like to get uh, Komal uh, and thanks a lot for putting up this session. Thank you, Anuj. Audrey, yeah. Shiva and Mervyn for your, uh, sharing your insights and your experiences. It's been a fabulous session. We've now come to the end of it. Um, this session has been made possible through the kind support of our festival partners, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Sesame Workshop India, the Rockefeller Foundation, COVID Action CoLab, uh, VNB Advisory Services, the British Asian Trust, WPP India CSR Foundation, Catalyst Management, and Satwa. You can continue chatting with the speakers and fellow delegates in this session. Please make sure um, you're using the messaging and meet function of our festival platform and share the highlights of this session on social media. And remember to tag us using the hashtag Impact South Asia 2021. Um, the next session's already started. It's reaching the unreached in, the, in a health pandemic. Um, thank you and please join us for the rest of the conference. Thanks again, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Yeah, stay Bye. safe. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Nice to run. Well done. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.